Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Living Theosophy on Sunday night. Very excited about tonight's episode. I love this platform where you are able to come in and and join these beautiful minds of compassion and fellow dedicated students of theosophy. Remember, this hour is brought to you in part by the Theosophical Society headquarters out of London, England. Highly recommend their diploma course starting at the top of every year. Uh, And also the Virtual Center for Theosophical Studies, which is an international center of the Theosophical society committed to making known the teachings of theosophy to youth which would be 45 and under that's the target demo but you can be young at heart around the world using the digital platforms because the entire world now is on their phones so if you'd like more information there will be links in the bio and tonight our guest you see him sitting there right now we have a class together every thursday night he is a beautiful soul peter Briarly is our guest tonight now peter traveled widely in his 22 year career in banking IT. He was posted as an expatriate living in Japan and Hong Kong. In 2002, Peter decided to follow a more healing, people-centered path, and he retrained as an Alexander Technique teacher, working with people on their posture and related issues. And also he qualified as a Shaw swimming teacher, which is a holistic method, that is a holistic method of teaching swimming without end gaining. And it was about this time that Peter started to feel a calling to mystical spirituality. And he has been eager ever since. In 2008, Peter undertook two years training with the One Spirit Interfaith Foundation, which offers experiential training exploring the worlds of many faith paths. He has been a member of the Theosophical Society since 2015, and he is secretary of Blavatsky Lodge in London. Peter is now retired and lives in Hertfordshire with his wife, Pat, and family. And tonight's subject is a very important one. You may want to rewatch it time and again. Tonight, we're going to be talking about what is higher mind? What is the higher mind? And how do we find it? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Briarly. Welcome, Peter. Good evening. It is wonderful to have you tonight. And we do get a chance to have classes together on Thursday, which is an honor. And that's how I got to know you. Um, We actually study uh, the secret doctrine together, but there's so much in this, these texts, these sacred texts that have come through the millennia. Uh, Peter has put together a presentation for us on the higher mind. We do talk about the lower and the higher mind quite often. And I'm very much looking forward to this. So whenever you're ready, dear, go ahead and start your slides and we'll go from there. Thank you, Anne. I will continue. So, Peter, what is the higher mind and how do we find it? That's um, a very good question, Anne. So I've done my best uh, here to put a presentation together to look at this, um, you know, from the viewpoint of, you know, how the world of religion has approached this. um, What is theosophy's view? um, And maybe we can we can get some clues uh, from this. Is there such a thing as higher mind? If so, where is it to be found? We cannot find it physically, even using using modern scientific equipment, such as an MRI scanner. In the theosophical teachings and Eastern mystical worldview, it is not considered to be located externally as a God in the sky. Rather, that divinity lies hidden deep within us. Now, even orthodox monotheistic religion gives clues to the true meaning. Unfortunately, they are often written as allegory in religious scriptures, and esoteric message is misunderstood or lost. But deep within, there is an inner yearning for something more meaningful in our existence, other than just living to acquire yet more material stuff that never quite satisfies us fully. How can we get access to this higher level of consciousness? It seems so elusive. Sometimes from nowhere, we have this feeling of oneness with nature or witnessing unconditional love, realizing there's nothing to fix. Everything is as it should be. What is it? Where does it come from? Mm-hmm. Now, there's some, there's some pointers there in, um, in religious scripts, um, but quite often, you know, they're, they're misinterpreted. Um, they're not fully understood. Mm. Um, and obviously, you know, around a lot of this stuff, there's a lot of religious dogma. But, you know, Jesus, this is from John 14. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, you know, we would say in theosophy that when he refers to the Father, he is referring to the higher self within him that's equally accessible to you and me. That would be our understanding. And obviously in um, theosophy, you know, we, we need to dig beneath dogma. Um, and obviously the, that's, this is, there's never been a truer saying, there is nothing, no religion higher than truth. Mm. And then we've got a quote from the Quran, which is another clue to where does divinity lie. And it says in the Quran, and indeed we have created man and we know whatever thoughts his inner self develops and we are closer to him than his jugular vein. So you can't get much more closer than that. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. This is a, there's a Hindu legend, which I, I really, um, I really like, um, which uh, it really explains the, the issues that um, we, you know, sometimes as humans, we can't see what's right under our noses. Um, so according to this old Hindu legend, there was once a time when all human beings were gods, but they so abused their divinity that Brahma, the chief god, decided to take it away from them and hide it where it could never be found. So where to hide their divinity was the question. So Brahma called a council of the gods to help him decide. Well, let's bury it deep in the earth, said the gods. But Brahma answered, no, that will not do because humans will dig into the earth and find it. Then the gods said, let's sink it in the deepest ocean. But Brahma said, no, not there, for they will learn to dive into the ocean and will find it. Then the gods said, let's take it to the top of the highest mountain and hide it there. But once again, Brahma said, replied, no, that will not do either because they would eventually climb every mountain and once again take up their divinity. Then the gods said, then the gods gave up and said, we don't know, do not know where to hide it because it seems that there is no place on earth or in the sea that human beings will not eventually reach. Brahma thought for a long time and then said, here is what we will do. We will hide their divinity deep in the center of their own being, for humans will never think to look for it there. All the gods agreed that this was the perfect hiding place and the deed was done. And since that time, humans have been going up and down the earth, digging, diving, climbing, and exploring, searching for something that is already within themselves. So what's the issue with, with the lower mind? Um, I'll, I'll come on and, and talk, I've got a, um, a diagram in a minute to, to show the, the uh, sevenfold constitution of man uh, in theosophy. But let's just have a, a look at what are the issues with lower mind. Remember in theosophy we talk of the lower mind, the, the, the manus, which is to think, is split into we have a lower, lower mind and we have a higher mind, which is what we're trying to get to the bottom of in this, uh, this talk. So humans are different to animals as we have self-awareness and are capable of reasoning. It is possible to be the observer of our own thoughts and we can differentiate what to think and even change how we think at a conscious level. Whereas an animal thinks on inherited instincts or learned behaviors, we know we're, we're going to die, whereas an animal doesn't. Human beings can actually differentiate between good thinking and harmful thinking. This is where awakening our spiritual awareness can give another dimension in how to improve our thinking process as a tool to access and experience higher consciousness. Moreover, to discern what is actually real, which is permanent, and what is not real, which is temporary. However, we are born with a mind that is uncorrupted and innocent of divisive thinking. Yet it is often the case that due to parental bias, tribal thinking, or becoming part of a political or nationalist group, we start to feel separate and special. Mm. This specialness develops a them and us mentality. This can result in distrust and hatreds of others outside of our group. So we can become slaves to our lower ego 
And any attempt to lead us to another path is felt as a personal attack and a threat to our personal security. This is a big issue we all have, don't we, with, uh, with uh, ego. Yes, too much. In philosophy, we talk of mind as being dual. Lower manus, mind, and higher manus. Now, manus in Sanskrit means to think. Um, and that is the fifth principle, which is part of the upper triad that is immortal, was never born, and will never die. The lower manus identifies with our sense objects. Of course, we all know what happens, what, what it means to have a monkey mind, a mind that is never satisfied and just jumps around like a primate in a tree. What if we could find access to this great treasury within and try to connect with this divine power, the core of our being? For those, anybody watching that's not a, a student of theosophy, um, this is really the septen septenary nature of man which is uh, in, in seven parts. Uh, I've taken this from the key to philosophy, page 92. Um, and there's some interesting comments which we'll come to from HPB, um, Madame Blavatsky. Okay, so if you look, there are seven principles, starting from the physical body right up to atmospheric. The four lower principles are temporary because they will disintegrate when we die. Now, where it gets interesting is when we get to that fifth principle, because as I, as I said earlier, you know, it is split into higher and lower. So a lot of our lower thoughts, which is kind of everyday thinking, you know, are kind of controlled, you know, it gravitates down to karma rupa. And karma rupa is really our animal desires and passion for things, you know, that grasping that we want more, whatever that is. And, you know, a lot of people that, you know, are really in trouble, you know, that they, they feel that, you know, that they can never, never be satisfied. There's always a hole in their life because they can never fulfill it. Isn't it enough is never enough. Um, and then we, we look at higher manners. That's kind of buddhi manners. It, it links upwards. Now, as we said before, just because we can't see it on the MRI scan doesn't mean it's not there. Mm. It means that, that this exists as that treasury within, and we, we have access to it. And this is the whole point of this uh, talk today, is to see how we can try and get access to this higher manus. But if we, if we, if we look at manus, mind being dual, during a lifetime, an individual can affect his or her spiritual destiny by their actions and by cultivating the mind through spiritual development. That's the personal choice. Alternatively, they can stay rooted in base animal desire and instinctive behavior. Okay. Now, if we, if we look at what, and I'm quoting now from HPB, she says, the future state and karmic destiny of man depend on whether manas gravitates more downward to karma rupa, the seat of the animal passions, or upwards to buddhi, the spiritual ego. In the latter case, the higher consciousness of, of the individual spiritual aspirations of mind, assimilating buddhi, I absorb by it and form the ego, which goes into devachanic bliss. So what we're referring to there is that any progress we make in our lifetime in developing our spirituality doesn't die with us. Mm. It's like, you know, we've made a good investment and we're going to dividend passes through our future lives. A, a, another thing that the word is often used is we, we talk about there's a bridge between lower manners and higher manners. And there's two san Sanskrit terms for this, antakarana and antaskarana, the bridge between lower manas and higher manas. It's a kind of communication channel between the higher and lower manas, the divine ego and the personal soul of man. After death, accumulated individual spiritual knowledge is carried on into the next incarnation. As we evolve, this learning from past experiences allows the opportunity to help others and bring harmony to the world in future incarnations.
So this this term of the bridge, um, this analogy, you know, is used quite a bit in religious symbology. Now, for example, in Christianity, it's sometimes used to demonstrate um, how sinful man is crossing over the bridge to Jesus and eternity. It's one example, but there's many examples in the world religions of um, the bridge sim symbology. But in philosophy, we, we see it as kind of a communication pathway between the two. Um, and, and as we as we as we go on in this talk, you know, um, HPB often refers to the mirror covered in dust. So if you can imagine that the bridge we're looking at on the screen now, you know, is a mirror, there's dust. Before we can, we can communicate, have communion with higher mind, we need to clear away the dust. It's there. It's always been there. It's not going anywhere. Um, so, um, and obviously it can mean different things to different people. Certainly different religions have a different take, a different perspective on it. But in theosophy, you know, and certainly in um, Advaita Vedanta, you know, the, 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 you'll see the word self with a capital S. Yes. That is our true self, the imperishable self. I wanted to ask you, um, as you open with those beautiful quotes from the Bible, then the Quran, and then you had uh, this Hindu, that was a beautiful, I'd never heard that before, talking about it being hidden within, that was gorgeous. And also your studies uh, that have led you now uh, to be a dedicated student of theosophy, you, in our, in our objectives, it talks about looking for the commonalities of all the religions, sciences, and philosophies. Um, as you're cross-examining this, you can see the same thing being said throughout all the religions religions, can you not? Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, the, um, you'll see this, uh, you know, uh, you know it's, it's explained differently with different symb symbiology, but, but it's there, you just have to kind of dig down for it. But, but I think what sometimes is a shame is that the, the true meaning of this, it's a bit like uh, at one point, um, you know, Christianity used to believe in reincarnation, yes, they but they don't now. So, so, you know, over years, um, you know, this, the, the water's got muddy, the story's changed, and then, you know, yeah, um, diff different religions have their own perspective on it. But I, I think, you know, what drew me to theosophy was um, this belief. I could never understand what we could achieve in one short lifetime. That's true. Very short. For 60 years at the most or whatever, uh, to get in everything you need to know, it can't possibly be done. And uh, you explained it beautifully. And there's so much in it, the rainbow bridge, the antakarana, or um, the higher and lower self. Um, hopefully in this talk in one hour, we're gonna be able to give them a little bit of information from this fantastic information you put together, uh, but that they can take with them. Um, often I will describe it when somebody asks me this question, I talk about the vices and the virtues. Uh, mm -hmm. vices of man, of greed, and, and if you're in a space of lust, greed, fear, uh, selfishness, anger, um, pride, that's the lower self. If you go into the higher self, we go to the virtues. That would be an easy way to identify it. It's just patience and kindness and goodness and love and empathy and um, just unconditional compassion. Um, and I kind of leave it like that, which is a very generic way of describing it. But you described it quite beautifully. Um, do you find that um, people ask you when they ask, what is theosophy? Because we mentioned terms like if somebody's just coming across this video and you hear us say HPB, that is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who wrote down some of the most important texts over the last 2000 years. However, theosophy goes back farther than the 19th century. It is ancient, timeless, and ageless. And uh, Peter has studied uh, uh, the world religions and he is a dedicated student of theosophy. And what he's sharing with us here is how to access the higher mind. So you hear a few things sprinkled in there like the, uh, you see the seven, uh, well, principles, they're called different things, but you see that the physical self, then you have the prana, the life force, then you talk about the astral body. These are real things. These are, if you wanna find out the science uh, where it is based on fact, not faith, see theosophy, pay attention to what Peter is saying. How, how do you s describe uh, to someone who asks you, uh, and this is a personal question, I, I like to ask guests on the show this because it's interesting to hear how you describe it. When people ask you, why theosophy? Why have you chosen theosophy uh, to go ahead and, and, and study? Be, why are you here as a theosophist based on your experience on your metaphysical journey 
and to the mystic exploration? Yeah, good, good question. Um, for me personally, what I describe it on is, is a kind of knowing. It's a kind of universal knowing yes. that passes down through the generations. Yes. And to me, theosophy encapsulated that, you know, that, um, it, you know, all through revolutions, the crusades, whatever, all of this upheaval, all through the centuries, this universal knowledge, which is thousands and thousands of years old, yes, yes. just passes on. So uh, that to me, it's meant to be. And, you know, I've, I've always thought that, you know, everything reincarnates, everything is recycled. Yes. You know, the daffodils will come back in the spring to every atom in, in our body is recycled. So um, to me, uh, that philosophy and learning world religions took me through more to the, the mystical side that I found related directly to me. I never got, got on well singing hymns in, in church and being told what to think. It didn't really work for me. Right. Uh, this is it. Take it or leave it. You know, if you don't take it, you know, well, you're a sinner. It's so kind of thing, yeah. the, uh, what theosophy gives you is, it's so important, is that we must find the truth for ourselves. Yes. Again, mm -hmm. let's repeat that really quick. You must find the truth yourself. If you're here watching this, it isn't about me. It isn't about Peter. These teachings are about you. So I always like to reiterate that because it's what you do and how you apply and how you uh, self-assess. It isn't one, like you mentioned dogma earlier, this is a dogma-free and ego-free zone, or it's supposed to be. Um, that's how it's supposed to be. This isn't you have to do it this way. This is, a, this is the journey of self, yourself, to find your, your higher self. Um, how would you describe to those who say, oh, theosophy is just another religion? How would you answer that question? That yeah, I would say it, it, it's not because we're, we're trying to search the truth and that all of all religions of the world are valid. Um, but it's finding the truth and the, and the, the crossover points, the commonality. Yes. Yeah. That is the truth because, um, you know, a, a great quote I like is from Gandhi, God has no religion. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? All it religions is. are human made. It's okay? true. And, and they, of course, they, they all, you know, there's mm. the ceremony, the ceremony involved and worship and, you know, and that may be right. There's many different ways to find that truth. So, it's up to each individual. There's, there's no right or wrong way. We should never criticize anybody for their, for their right. beliefs. Mm -hmm. All are welcome, and it isn't a one-size-fits-all. This is nothing. You don't have to follow anybody. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to go anywhere. Nature is the church. You are the temple. Anything that takes place on your journey happens within you, and that's what Peter is talking about is our, as our higher mind. A lot of people um, might ask about meditation, where you have to be able to meditate a certain way in order to reach this higher mind. And um, I know that we have more to cover, and we've already <laughs> been talking for a little bit. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, you are very uh, patient and such a, an important guest here. It's just so lovely to have you, Peter. Uh, if you're ready for us to go into the next section. Um, I would. Uh, what is there to be gained by expanding our consciousness, by going from the higher to the lower self, this God space within us? What is it to be gained by the individual by expanding our consciousness? This quote here um, from Sankaracharya, uh, there's a story to this. That, um, in the early days when I was looking for, kind of, for want of a better word, some spiritual enlightenment, I went to a, um, it was at this spiritual workshop somewhere, and they had this uh, bag with, for the quotes. You just put your hand in and took one out at random, and this is what came out. Oh. So to me, what is the point of um, you know, trying to access uh, my mind? Mm. And um, it says it all to me there. You know, Self-knowledge alone is the direct cause of liberation. Mm. Mm. If we don't know that we have a higher self and that we can access, access if we want to. If we're stuck in a kind of lower self human misery where we think all we've got to look forward to is old age and death, you know, it's like being in, in a prison, isn't it? You yes. Yeah. So if we know that 
there's part of us that is indestructible and goes on um, and is total peace, yeah, then this is, is freedom. You know, so, so this to me kind of says it all. I wanted to um, just give a quote from Eckhart Tolle. Um, I, I don't know if any of the readers, uh, the viewers rather, had um, read his books, you know, The Power of Now. I'm familiar with him. He's pretty big, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he's very big in the States. So, um, in the man manifested temporary world we call home, all of our thoughts and emotional responses are governed by the lower ego. ego. As we already stated, this is very limiting as our perceptions are colored by our own individual life experiences and secondhand thoughts passed on to us by family, society, and the nation we are born into. So in a way, we're stuck in a kind of prison in our heads. We are limited by time and space. Beyond the lower mind, there is no time or space or limitations. Quite often our thoughts are not real. They are illusionary. They are. Some of a Sanskrit word, mm. but they are so habitually ingrained in our lower mind, we believe them to be real. This causes untold suffering to ourselves, others, and nature. This prevents us from forming a universal brother or sisterhood and to live in harmony with our inner divinity. Mm. And what Eckhart, the quote I've shown you here, I, I think it's, it's very good, is that the beginning of freedom is a realization that you are not the thinker. The moment you start watching the thinker, a higher level of conscience, consciousness becomes activated. You then begin to realize that there is a vast realm of intelligence beyond thought, and that thought is only a tiny aspect of that intelligence. You also realize that all things that truly matter, beauty, love, creativity, joy, inner peace, arise from beyond the mind. Mm. you begin to awaken. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we, we've talked about what lies beyond. So it's hard, we, we'll never, you know, we, we're talking, we're in the realm of the absolute, which is not something we can normally, we, we can't really communicate with. Um, so in this higher mind, it probably helps to know what we're free from. And I found, I found this beautiful quote um, from... Hinduism um, about Shiva. Uh, Shiva is the you know part of the Hindu tr trinity, is the destroyer of the world, following Brahma, the creator, and Vishnu, the preserver. After which Brahma again creates the world and so on. Shiva is responsible for change, both in the form of death and destruction, and in the positive sense of the shedding of old. So this is what we're talking about here. We need to shed those old habits to open up that bridge. In Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram, or truth, goodness and beauty. Shiva also represents the most essential goodness. So the word Shiva means the deathless, changeless, timeless, formless, all pervading absolute essence of the universe. And higher mind is part of that. I am not the mind, the intellect, the ego, or the memory. I am not the ears, the skin, the nose, or the eyes. I am not space, not earth, not fire, not water or wind. I am the form of consciousness and bliss. I am the eternal Shiva. I am not the breath, nor the five elements. I am not the matter, nor the five sheaves of consciousness. Nor am I the speech, the hands or the feet. I am the form of consciousness and bliss. I am the eternal Shiva. There is no like or dislike in me. No greed or delusion. I know not pride or jealousy. I have no duty, no desire for wealth, lust or liberation. I am the form of consciousness and bliss. I am the eternal Shiva. No virtue or vice, no pleasure or pain. I need no mantras, no pilgrimage, no scriptures or rituals. I am not the experience nor the experience itself. I am the form of consciousness and bliss. I am the eternal Shiva. I have no fear of death, no caste or creed. I have no father, no mother, for I was never born. I am not a relative, nor a friend, nor a teacher, nor a student. I am the form of consciousness and bliss. I am the eternal Shiva. I am devoid of duality. My form is formless. I exist everywhere, pervading all senses. I am neither attached, neither free, nor captive. 
I am the form of consciousness and bliss. I am the eternal Shiva. Mm. That is what is beyond in, in my studies is that, you know, once we get away from the lower mind and all its limitations, mm. we're totally free. This is the freedom I was referring to earlier. Mm. Thank you. Okay. So we're talking about what is to gain. Um, so we, we, if, if we take a quick look at the Bhagavad Gita, um, again, there's this dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna, which again, um, I think you mentioned in one of your talks that I went to around that this is again kind of allegory for um, communion between the lower mind and higher mind. Okay, yeah, okay. Every selfless act, Arjuna, is born from Brahman, the eternal, infinite good Godhead. He is present in every act of service. All life turns on this law, O Arjuna. Whoever violates it, indulging his senses for his own pleasure and ignoring the needs of others, has wasted his life. But those who realize the self are always satisfied, having found the source of joy and fulfillment, they no longer seek happiness from external world. They have nothing to gain or lose by any action. Neither people nor things can affect their security. Mm. Strive constantly to serve the welfare of the world by devotion from selfless work one attains the supreme goal of life. Do your work with the welfare of others always in mind. So again, the Bhagavad Gita, we talked about the world religions and truth. There is some truth. That's beautiful truth. Absolutely. It's extraordinary. Thank you. So again, um, Dr. De Peruca um, talks about the inner light again, and, and the benefits of the inner light, or what the inner light actually is. The radiant light which streams forth from that immortal center or core of our inmost being, which is our inner God, lightens the pathway of each one of us. And it is from this light that we obtain ideal conceptions. It is by this radiant light in our hearts that we can guide our feet towards and ever larger fulfilling in daily life of the beautiful conceptions which we as mere human beings dimly or clearly perceive as the case may be. The divine fire which moves through universal nature is the source of the individualized divine fire coming from man's inner God. The modern Christians of a mystical bent of mind call the inner God the, the Christ imminent, mm. the imminent Christos. Mm. In Buddhism, it is called the living Buddha within. In Brahmanism, it is, called, it is spoken of as the Brahma in Brahmapura or Brahma city, which is the inner constitution, which is what we're talking about. Hence, call it by what name you please, the reflective and mystical mind intuitively realizes that there works through him a divine flame, a divine life, a divine light, and that this by whatever name we may call it is himself, his essential self. God within. Oh, it's so lovely. Yes, it really is just so striking how how lovely this feels to hear this. Even if you're just listening to it and you don't even know what it means, just listen to it until it begins to mean something. Just spending time with it is just so incredible. So uh, would you like to pause here for a moment? Yes, I think we should, we should pause here. Yeah, you had some amazing slides there talking about um, that to know yourself to truly know yourself, like even at the Oracle at Delphi, it says, if you know yourself, you'll understand the universe. Um, and um, I, I think some, I'm not sure how we get lost on those that stay on the animal path of, because I was certainly, I spent a majority of my life making terrible mistakes and being selfish and self-destructive. Um, uh, and so I, I don't understand, um, to know thyself. When I used to hear that, I thought, what does that mean, know yourself? And of course, I went straight for the ego, the personality. And later on in my life, as I began my own journey, I began to understand there's far more questions than answers. And that uh, to know yourself means you can know the universe. Um, and mm. as, as you explain that, so so gorgeous to hear the, de the description of Shiva, the absolute, the all that there is, 
what is the percentage of people that you you think right now are i mean how many of us are are just living paycheck to paycheck in the lower self and then we die and that's it and it's just an endless void and how many of us are out there do you believe that might actually be looking for this it feels like there might be more of us than there was before i'm not sure what do you think yeah i think you know what you see is um People are, you know, whether it's through, you know, just personal interest or sometimes through great tragedy, yeah. people are, are looking for more for a purpose, aren't they? That there's yes. got to be more to than just grasping for the next kind of sensory hit, if you like. You know that we're, we're the, the, you know, you speak to people, and, and there is seem to be even in the, you know, the, this time where we, we seem to be stuck in, you know deepest matter where you know everything is so material and it's you know the you know, this terrible time we're going through with the with the the, the planet and um you know it, the, you, but what you'll see on the other side of the coin is you, you you do come across a lot of people who are just getting this feeling of knowing that i referred to before that, that there is something more there is actually a purpose so somebody is kind of knocking on the door there to say wake up you know there there is more so i think it's just passing through but but you're right in saying that there's you know um, not many i mean if you look at the <laughs> the number of theosophists in the world it's not a, a massive number but um but that doesn't mean that the people are not you know finding their own path but again as you as you mentioned uh, i'm still fascinated by the fact that you you cross studied all of the world's religions i think that would be highly educational for all of us to cross-reference all the world's religions. This is at a time where there was no internet, everybody who's watching the show. These sages through the ages and uh, these religions uh, are all saying the same thing throughout thousands and thousands of years. Now that's not by chance. And if they're saying the same thing as you cross-reference and you find the commonalities, which we do in theosophy, and they're saying that there is far more as Peter was just saying, than just the world of the senses. Uh, but often, Peter, um, I have people who are not familiar with theosophy that say, there's no way, I don't believe it because I haven't seen it. And mm -hmm. I often say to them, well, there's no way that you can understand it until it happens to you, uh, because that's where you have the fact, not faith. So as we're talking about this higher mind, I know that in my own journey, I have had experiences where I go, there's got to be more to the story. So there's a hunger inside me to try to find out more. And as I mentioned before, the more I study, the more questions I have. How would you, how would you explain to those that are curious uh, is there something outside the five senses? How do I know that there is this higher mind that he speaks of? Um, how would you say to the layman who's coming across this channel that isn't a, a student of theosophy, um, that there is something beyond the five physical senses? Yeah, I, I, I would say just from my own personal experiences that, that you start to get kind of hunches, you know, you start to, you start to things happen, you know, I, I found for for ages, I kept staring at the clouds. I've never stared at the yes, clouds. Yes. <laughs> you know, taking more notice of nature. Where yes. did this come from? I, I didn't, you know, no, nobody sent me a letter saying I had to do it. So, <laughs> um, and uh, it, it kind of, you know, the, the, the more you open, you know, the more hunches you get, you know. I, I, it's just kind of knowing, you know, sometimes you can be somewhere and everything just feels right. Everything is in synchronicity. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes only a fleeting glimpse, you know, and it's gone. But at those moments, you think, well, everything, what am I worrying about? You know, every, everything is as it should be. That was, you said that in the beginning, and I find that so comforting when, uh, when you want to try to get swept up in the, oh my gosh, oh, this is so terrible, and all suffering is coming from wanting it to be different than the way that it is, and that acceptance that we're taught, being acceptance, being in the now, like Eckhart Tolle, as you said, um, it talks about the power of the now, because that's when we're going to die. It'll be now. What mm. we were just talking about a few minutes ago, that was now, but this is now, now. And so we're always spending time in other times than the now. And what a valuable moment this is, because we're in eternity as much as we'll ever be in the now. And so all of these things that you're talking about, for those who are curious, whoever, if you're watching this video, like Peter said, it's exactly as it's supposed to be. You're supposed to hear this information. So take from it what you will. Listen to it again. Figure out what ticks the box inside of you and follow your nose, follow your heart. 
and look further into these sacred texts. You don't have to understand them the first time, the 10th time, the 100th time, but whatever it is that that pops out at you, that inspires you, apply that, apply it in your regular everyday life and see how that works for you. Um, I know that that's what I did. I thought I had nothing to lose and it was during a time of great pain, which you'd said um, that um, pain is the usher of wisdom. And sometimes we turn to this to try to find solace or comfort. And that's when it, it seemed to stick the most. So uh, as people are turning, going to the, the buildings that seem to be hollow, where are these answers? Are they being doled out? Um, or can they be discovered? Can they be earned and learned? Um, they cannot be given to you by anybody else. But um, Peter, what would you say to those who are looking to try to find higher mind? Right now, they're watching this video. And I know we're going to be talking about how we can access the higher mind in just moments. Um, but um, what would you say in your own personal experience when you realized that there was something beyond the five senses, can you describe a little bit of your own personal journey of what that was like for you? Yeah, uh, for me, it was, um, if I was alone in the house, I'd always have to have noise, like the radio or TV on. Yes. I, I'm the other way. I just adore silence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it kind of speaks to me. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> um, now some people may think I'm being antisocial, but no, no so, you know, for me, it's it, it's kind of looking through a different life through a different lens. You know that I'm not going to take things personally. Bad things happen to us. We we can't stop that. But not taking things before it would be I play the blame game. You know, it's his fault, her fault, whatever. Yeah. But if I take that view that it's it's meant to be, it's learning. It's part of my karma. It's not personal. I'm not taking it personally. So for me, that was the kind of awakening was not to take life. And, and then there's, there's massive suffering you know, out there, um, massive joy out there. But I, I, I the fleeting glimpses, um, not to take them personally, that there's more. I love the way that you describe them as fleeting glimpses, because a lot of people feel that if there's any enlightenment, that all of a sudden, ah, and everything's perfect. It's not like that in my understanding. You get fleeting glimpses and inspiration. And then of course the cycles come as day into night. There is darkness and there is light. You will have difficulties and great grief and you will also have uh, triumphs and joys. And that's part of being in the physical world. But there is a instruction manual, if you will, to be able to navigate this world the best you can to try to leave it a little better than when you got here. So, um, Peter, may I ask another personal question about your, your journey? When you were younger, did this appeal to you, this uh, mystic side of life, or did you have to have, was there a certain occurrence in your life that kind of shook you awake? Um, I know you mentioned that it was, um, you know, you, you began your path a while back. Was there any in particular um, sub something that happened, occurrence, that uh, set you on your trajectory? No, I, I think it's different for everybody. For me, it's been a gradual thing, you know, um, and a lot of it, what I thought was coincidence was not. Now, I'm a firm, a firm disbeliever in coincidence. Yes. yes. So, um, but, um, you know, uh, um, you know, before, uh, you know, it, when I look back, you know, I, in some ways I'm, I'm kind of ashamed because I was in that kind of, corporate world where oh, yeah. it was you know whatever you have to do to get on mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, if you're not if not if you're not moving up you're moving out you know? yeah. and, uh, I had times you know not for my own fault but I, I had to kind of let people go and I became hardened to it it didn't bother me oh yeah and I was kind of because I didn't worry about the person I was becoming you know so and I, and I, I always had this kind of yearning the simplicity and I, and I realized that I was never going to find it and that's why you know I kind of jumped off the corporate bandwagon mm -hmm. and wanted to do something where I was kind of relating more to people and not hurting anybody directly or indirectly. I understand would you call yourself an empath would you would you relate to that? Yes definitely yeah. I, I, I tried to do that. Yeah. 
I like to give shout outs to empaths if they're coming across this channel. Um, a lot of them say, you know, I want to save the world. I feel like I want to help. I just don't know what to do. I highly recommend the study and application of the theosophical teachings. And with that, we can move on to our next batch of slides. If you're ready, Peter, are you ready? Yeah. Um, we have um, accessing the higher mind. So how do we do that? Now, now we know that there is a higher mind. We are certainly familiar with the lower self, the lower mind. How do we access the higher mind, Peter Brierley? Okay, I'm starting off, sorry to be doom and gloom, I'm starting off with, with a warning. Okay. <laughs> I just, this <laughs> from the Upanishads. Um, it, is, it is not easy, but it's so worthwhile. But the, the Upanishads, there's this quote saying, you may drink the ocean dry, you may uproot from its base, the mountain Meru, you may swallow fire. But more difficult than all the oh good one is control over the mind. Oh. So that was 1907, the spirit of new punishments. It's very true. <laughs> okay, so I won't dwell on that, but um, obviously, like anything worth having in life, it takes work. <laughs> we'll know that. Okay. So, how, you know, how do we do it? It's, it is, uh, it is different difficult you know so the heading there is you know i think with normal thinking because we, we looked at before that um you know with normal thinking you know we're always going to be gravitating down to karma rupa which is kind of habitually ingrained in our in our psyche so as soon as we try to access higher mind using our unreliable egoic thought patterns why we're in trouble because our thoughts will try and refer to our lower mind karma rupa mode of thinking this is linked to our human sensory perceptions, which we know are faulty, and will always reference our back catalogue of unreliable memories and perceptions from childhood. We may end up trying to make it happen through a strong desire to end game to get a result. Higher mind is on another level of vibrational frequency. It is part of the whole, the absolute, that underlies the entire cosmos. The true self, is not a discretional God that we can pray to for favorable treatment or personal gain for ourselves or others. In order to find a pathway to this vibration frequency of our inner mind, we need to turn within and awaken our awareness of the inner light, our ultimate reality. As students of theosophy, we believe that we live many lives and that to a large extent, we incarnate with a blueprint or predestination due to our actions in this and past lives. We have free will to make amends and ability to change our future. Karma is a universal law of balance and none of us get special favors. This is all in the realm of higher mind and by turning within, we can get a sense of our knowing our true self and life's purpose. So to move forward, we must find ways to try change our habitual thought processes that do not serve as well. And we, we all have, don't we, you know, habitual thoughts. Oh, yeah. um, are they real? Probably not. You know, um, we, we know those egoic tendencies, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm better than you. Mm. Are they true? No, they're not true. But they're ingrained in, in, in our minds, in our lower minds. And that kind of is a, is a block to moving forward with this. Okay, um, another quote from the Upanishads is, this immutable, this is never seen, but is a witness. It is never heard, but is a hearer. It is never thought, but is a thinker. It is never known, but is the knower. So this is the realm of my mind again, as again taken from the Upanishads. Mm. Right, now this is the interesting bit. Now remember, there is no one-size-fits-all recipe. Now, Anne and I tonight can't give everybody a recipe to take away uh, or take a, <laughs> a pill three times a day and then at the end of the week you'll be, you'll be there. That, that's be just great. not real. That'd be great. Can't do it that that's way. Really to do that, you know. But um, how to reveal the light within? We, we have to find a method that suits our temperament. Okay, and that goes with the world religions. You know, some people, you know, I knew a lady um, who got this calling and she, she went away, and she still is to, to I know, to my, to my knowledge, is, is a nun in a convent. Mm. And 
you know, her, her light, her inner knowing took her to Catholicism. She wasn't a Catholic. She wasn't brought up religious. I'm not going crit- to crit- criticize that. I've got my own views on that. But th- that was her. So other people may be to, to go and sit in a, in, a, in, a, in a Buddhist temple. You know? uh, it doesn't really matter. We, we've got to find the, the right one for us. Mm-hmm. So obviously a big one is mindfulness. You know, be still, listen to the silence. And there's, you know, there's, there's so many meditation techniques out there. You know, there's books and books nowadays on mindfulness. Um, we, we, you know, to order quite often to move forward, we, we have to give something up. So you're, you're, again, you'll see this in all the texts. HBB talks about it a lot in the secret doctrine. Um, is renunciation. We've got to give up selfish desires. I can't be a hypocrite, you know, and I can't be saying that, you know, I want to live a more spiritual life, but I'm, um, you know, fiddling my tax return dishonest, <laughs> dishonestly. Now, how, how could I do that and then talk about this stuff? It, you know, I'm not being true to myself. So I would, giving up selfish desires is a big one. We've talked about this a lot, living in the moment, being in touch with our inner core. You know, the more, the more you kind of think about that higher mind or that higher level of consciousness, it kind of starts to come through. Of, no one living in harmony with nature. Is, isn't nature God? <laughs> living in harmony with nature, we, we tend to think we're better than nature mm-hmm. now we're above it mm-hmm. but I, I think um, you know future generations are in, in for a shock with global warming um break free don't get stuck in fight or flight fight or flight is when and I, I can put my hands up to this one in my business days you know i would be running around um, I'm really surprised my marriage survived, really, running around, living in my head, fighting fires. And of course, you know, any doctor will tell you that's stress. And we know the, un- you know, it raises your cortisol levels, your adrenaline. And if you do that long term, it's damaging to the body. So, and also damaging to your mind. And you're never, if you're stuck in that, that world, I mean, then this is where, you know, you were saying, Anne, about how do people change? You know, um, people, are often living in this and then they find maybe like I did the time in their life when they need to change down the gear or, or find something that more suits their personality rather than just going for the paycheck. Mm-hmm. Right living. Okay. That's been in the slides. Altruism, unconditional love, expecting nothing in return. Mm-hmm. And again, that, this is one of the warnings I think in, in spirituality, you know, if, we, if, you, if we believe in karma and that we can you know cre- create bad karma and good karma if i'm if i'm thinking well actually you know i'll do some good things just to help myself to get good karma then that's not unconditional love right. I'm doing it. you know so the motivation with right living is the key you know what what is the motivation for the action we're doing is it doing it to help me or or am i doing it to help somebody without thinking of the consequences. Mm. Okay, stop worrying. Again, we were a living worrier. I used to be a big worrier. I still am, am some days. And our inner light will reveal that all is as it should be. Uh, yes. Suffering and joy are meant to be. Don't take anything as a personal affront. Mm. If we take it personally, it's not true. No, nobody's out to get us. And we can all have terrible experiences, but nobody's out to get us. Okay. Okay. I'm going to um, talk about the art of non-doing. This this came about through uh, when I was uh, I came back across this. Um, it's from the Tao actually. That um, when I was uh, trained to be an Alexander teacher, which took three years of training. That um, I, I won't have the time to go into it now, but. Basically, you know, if you think, you know, we're born with pure thoughts, but, you know, we're not born sinners, you know, we're born with a clean sheet, yeah. But as, as we grow, we inherit all this garbage, you know, all this stuff about our personality, and a lot of the times it's not our fault. 
Okay, but if, if we do believe that, um, you know, it, the art of non doing is really, it describes it there, it's, it's going with the flow. So in the Tao, it says, do that which consists in taking no action and order will prevail. So it's better to bend like a willow than snap like a twig. So we learn to live our life better. This is how accessing the, you know, we're not taking things personally. We're going with the flow of life. You know, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? I could go down, be a flat tire. All sorts of things can happen. We, we don't know what's around the corner. But if we, can, if we can learn to not take it personally and go with the flow. So non-doing is often, you know, misunderstood as doing nothing. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's staying centered to be in the moment. It's listening to our inner voice. It's leading a life of simplicity. Allowing our life's purpose to unfold naturally. Mm-hmm. Our life's purpose is, is there. And that's why, you know, people do find, you know, these times in their life and they think, you know, I've been on the wrong path. I was very good, you know, being a lawyer or being a bank manager or being a whatever. The, but I feel this is my, and sometimes people find this late in life. Or if some people are really lucky, you know, they, they find it straight away. Um, but not being a slave to our thoughts, they are often untrue. Again, we've reiterated this many times. If we're stuck in our heads, we all are sometimes, we, we can never get out of that. And it is pure purgatory, isn't it? That is, that is the real, if you ask me what the word hell means, it's being stuck in your head. That's where you're going over this, this, you know, this thing that happened to us one time and we're never getting off, you know, we're just playing the same record. Yes. Um, you know, and so if we got, if we could get away from that, you know, um, then a higher level of consciousness is going to give us access to peace and blissfulness. Unlearning is another thing. You know, trying to stop doing the wrong thing to allow the right thing to happen. Mm. Yeah. Again, that's that's very deep, but. Mm. Uh, and it got example because I used to work with people's bodies and their posture and alignment. You know, some people would think, you know, well, you know, if somebody was very slumped and pulled down, the way to correct that would be to stand to attention like a soldier. Well, that's not non doing. That is doing, isn't it? I've exchanged one bad habit with another bad habit. So if we look at that on a spiritual level, you know, I can, you know, I could read every book in the world on theosophy, study every religion. If I'm not making the change within, yes, this point. yes. So, you know, I, I could go, <laughs> uh, I could go to theosophy headquarters. There's a whole library there. I could read every book, but if I'm not <laughs> making that inner change, I'm wasting my time. Yes, there are some people who do that. Yes, that's true. Another way, again, uh, there's many ways to do this, but if we look at all the systems of yoga in the world, mm. well, if you look at the etymology of the word yoga, it means to join, to yoke, or to unite. Mm. So aren't we trying to yoke or unite with a higher level of consciousness? Now, again, with yoga, I've only listed a few here. I know there's lots of yoga systems out there, but again, we have to find which one, if, if yoga is your path, we've got a lot of people uh, who are theosophists who started in spiritual yoga. Um, Hatha yoga, to explore the potential inherent in the body and to bring it to an optimum state of health and well-being. That might work for some folks. Raja yoga, to explore the potential of the mind and to go beyond mental limitations. That's another one. Bhakti yoga to explore the emotions and to try and direct them to uplift spirit and to purify the consciousness. Karma yoga to improve oneself by moderating behavior and actions. To work cooperatively with nature and the environment. Janana yoga, which is one I try to follow, to develop and improve our intelligence, to know and realize oneself by becoming free of the bondages of the world. Mm. So there's lots more, but finding, if you're going to find a spiritual path, it's got to be one that suits us. There isn't a one size fits all. It would be wrong to try and force somebody down a path that doesn't really suit them. It just won't work. So we're, we're about there. Um, what I wanted to finish with, Anne, uh, was a, a quote from the 
Voice of the Silence from HPV, where she kind of epitomizes the whole of this talk. So um, I'm going to just see what HPV tells us. Okay. So in the Voice of the Silence, Madame Blavatsky talks about the seeds of wisdom. Now, I know you're, you're a big fan, and I've listened to your, your voice, which is very soothing when you read from the Voice of the Silence. I've listened to that online. It's great. great text to read, very important text. Yes, it's beautiful. So if we read into this, again, it's not... When I, when I first read this, it didn't make sense. I had to read it about five times yeah. and kind of work out what she was saying. So it encapsulates everything of this talk to me. I, I couldn't believe I, I was so lucky to find it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the voice of the silence, um, this is really HPV, Madame Blavatsky. And to me, when I read this and I had to read it many times, it kind of uh, was a, a kind of wake up call. It, it really encapsulated this talk that I, that I was privileged to give this evening. So she goes on to say, the seeds of wisdom cannot sprout and grow in airless space. To live and read experience, the mind needs breadth and depth and points to draw it towards the diamond soul, which is really Buddha within, the awakening within. Seek not those points in Maya's realm, illusion in Maya, but soar beyond illusion, search the eternal and the changeless sat, which is absolute reality and truth. Mistrusting fancy false suggestions, which you know are those lacking doubts in our lower mind. For mind is like a mirror. It gathers dust while it reflects. It needs the gentle breeze of soul wisdom to brush away the dust of our illusions. Seek, O beginner, to blend thy mind and soul. Shun ignorance and light ones. Shun illusion. Avert thy face from world deceptions. Mistrust thy senses, they are false. But within thy body, the shrine of thy sensations, seek in the impersonal for the eternal man, which is I myself. Mm -hmm. And having sought him out, look inward, thou art Buddha. Oh. <laughs> Very well done. What a perfect, what a perfect quote to close on, dear Peter. Oh, I cannot thank you enough. Tonight's subject was all about the higher mind. And there are going to be things in there that may inspire you uh, and lead you to go into further study. Uh, remember that there really is no wrong way to do it. If it, if it triggers an interest in you, uh, follow that, follow that in your heart. Um, Peter, you talked on so many things. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about karma. Um, some of the, the folks, um, that I do come across in my experience, um, absolutely do not believe that there is any karma to balance. The ultimate law of equilibrium that we talk about in the theosophical teachings. Um, and it isn't so much punishment as is balance. This is a law of balance. As you do, so shall you reap. And so all of these things that, that Peter has mentioned from reincarnation to uh, finding that presence within you that is within all things, within all beings, recognizing this is you. Uh, Peter was also talking about nature. Uh, we destroy nature to build these buildings, to then go and worship the God that is invisible that we have just destroyed. We must pay attention to all of these beautiful teachings, these sacred wisdoms that have come through the ages into our world now. And the reason that Peter and I are here uh, studying theosophy, it just seems to be that they're gathered here and there is no dogma, there is no uh, staunch absolute have to. This is a, a free form way for you to be able to discover the truth within yourself. Um, uh, Peter, fantastic presentation on the higher mind um, and on the voice of the silence. Um, you mentioned how much you love being in the silence. Um, and that you don't probably have the TV on in the background as much as you're used to anymore, I, I imagine, yes? Yeah, that, that's really true. You know, it, it, um, uh, you know I, I really, if, if I'm in a noisy environment, which you, you can't avoid, you know, I, I quite look, I look forward to silence, but, which is the reverse, you know, before I always had to have the radio on or something like that, I always had to have noise. And so 
there's something in the silence that um, that speaks to you. It's not real silence. Yes, there is something in the silence, and there's something to be said about that. And so, as uh, everyone is coming back on this journey, and they're starting to look for these solutions and purpose and meaning. What is the meaning of life? Why is this happening? And how can I find out more? Well, uh, Peter has given you some amazing quotes to begin with from the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the Voice of the Silence. If you want to listen to the Voice of the Silence, absolutely free. You can listen. It's on this channel. Um, I was uh, quite um, ignorant to think that I could voice such a colossally sacred text, but I gave it my best. Um, and it is um, something that um, these, these are ancient. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, by her own admission in this text, admits she wrote them down. She did not come up with them. They came through her and she wrote them down. And uh, if you spend time with them, you, you listen to them, you read them, and then a few months later, you read them again, something new comes out of them. Um, they're always giving, always giving back. And uh, just being able to access that higher self, you called it something when you were talking about the Christians. It was so beautiful when you mentioned it, how they talked about that true Christ consciousness within. Um, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Uh, and you described that quite beautifully. Um, and there's so much I'd love to talk to you about. I cannot believe the time flew by so quickly. Is there anything that we didn't talk about, about the higher mind? What is it and how can we access it that we would like to cover before we close this, this amazing time together? No, I, I think it's just um, recognizing what our true self is, is it, and that, you know, our true self is not limited the way we think it is. You know, it's when we link to higher mind, it opens up a whole new dimension for us, that we're not, we're not trapped in, in lower mind. We're, you know, we're, we're just, which is obviously linked into our sensory perception. So, you know, we're always going to reference that back catalog, aren't we? We're always going to be referencing the things that happened to us when, you know, somebody stole our ice cream when we were five or whatever the story is, you know? So um, it's, it's that really, you know, for me, it was that picking that quote out of the bag that said it's the direct cause of liberation, that we, we can be free. Ah, oh, I can't think of anything better to end it on. But yes, it is liberation. You can be free. There is much suffering here on this planet, but there is also a solution and uh, a way to go ahead and find purpose, meaning, happiness, hope, compassion, and love, and to help ease the unnecessary suffering of all beings on our planet. And that's why we're here uh, sharing these teachings. We are not experts. We are students of theosophy, simply sharing with you our experience. And by sharing with uh, you our experience perhaps you may experience it as well and then you will share with others that is our goal peter Briarly. it has been an honor of honors to have you on this show thank you so so much thank you all for being here in the chat uh and please leave comments we'll get back to you i will put links down below uh to the uh some of the quotes that peter has mentioned and if you have any questions just drop a line we'll promise to get to you as as soon as we can uh things are getting very busy in the theosophical world um because of COVID, it has pushed a lot of the theosophical group, groups to go online, um, which is a very good thing to have. And Peter and I were just talking about that before we went live. There's a ton of theosophical sources online, and this is the way the world is communicating. They are talking on their phones, on their laptops, and so there's far more where this came from. Thank you, Peter. Um, all the love in the world to you, and I'll see you in class tomorrow. Yes? I will. I'll see you. Yes. I'll see you tomorrow. It's been a pleasure. Right? And, uh, uh, okay, all the love, and we will have. We'd love to have you back if you'd like to talk. There's so much more to talk about, from uh, karma and reincarnation uh, to the different yogas, all that different stuff. You were talking about again yoga. Wanted to close on that. Yoga means to unite. That is talking about to unite, and that is from the lower and the higher self. That rainbow bridge that is within all of us. Thank you, Peter. I love you, and I'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Anne.